discount. So we've been updated by government and by the president over and over again. Yesterday, the president gave us our sixth um, update where he announced that 378 cases have been confirmed in the country. And out of the enhanced contact tracing um, that was done, a total of 77 people have tested positive out of the over what um, 14,000 cases that um, came out as well, the tests that were ready. So we've been doing our calculation. We realized that if that's really the case, looking at the number where we were at before it was announced, and looking at the percentages of people who tested positive in Accra and in Kumasi out of the enhanced testing, we should get more than the 378. If we calculated right, then we're around 491 cases. What do you make of this? Have you had time to do your own calculations as well? No, oh, unfortunately, yesterday I was in a conference, so I didn't get to listen to the president's speech and do my own calculations. Mm. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, a week or two, was it last week when he gave the update? Yeah. And he said out of the 700 and something case, there were only 14. 7,000. Yeah, 7,000 yeah, on Nova. I remember telling you or somebody that with COVID, you can never say a number is too small mm -hmm. because that 14 is just the people you've tested. You haven't tested the contact of the 14. Mm. And given that the disease doubles every three days, anytime you hear a number, you have to go back and say, okay, when did those people test positive? So let's even go back to his last speech where he said 14 had tested positive. Yeah. If you go back two weeks and you notice that, okay, those people got infected two weeks ago, you have to double that every two days. So 14, two to the power seven might be, um, I don't have time to calculate that on national my, television, my, but <laughs> let's say it's 64 or yeah. something. Um, you have to quickly multiply that 14 by 64 and tell yourself that that is probably the number that is actually on the ground because you are just looking at a group of people. You're not considering the people they've infected, who those people have infected. So you, you just have to multiply it that way. And if you do that, you won't focus on one. I see. One small number. So there's a lot of math to be done over there. Do you think that there's a deliberate attempt as well? And we're not accusing government, but could there be a deliberate attempt to reduce the numbers just so that they don't get people too scared um, about what really the situation is? Um, I don't, you see, um, deliberate or not deliberate, I mean, a good example would be Iran. I mean, they like pretty much turned a blind eye mm -hmm. to what was going on in their country. And the next thing you knew, 25 MPs were positive. The, the deputy minister of health was sweating in public, and yeah. he, he tested positive. The bottom line is, with COVID-19, you, you cannot hide anything mm. because the disease will start revealing itself. So you cannot even try to manipulate um, numbers. I mean, a good example, too, is Japan. They were yeah. telling us to come over for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. and. People suspected, I mean, I don't have any evidence that maybe they were also diminishing their numbers. Their and numbers. the minute the Olympics was cancelled, suddenly they said they had a large outbreak and uh, the, the government was calling a state of emergency. Yeah. So you, you cannot hide any numbers because the sick people would come out. So one, I don't think any numbers are being hidden. Um, two, um, maybe they haven't tested a wide range enough. Um, and and, and that, that's just my conclusion, that you should always, and like I said yesterday, it only took one attorney in New Rochelle to infect 100 people, mm. and only one woman in a church in South, uh, South Korea yeah. infected 1,100 people. This is a highly, highly transmissible virus, and even one, and that's why the WHO is focusing on find your cases. That's the first thing. Yeah. Find your case go around it, find the contacts, and then isolate. Because this is spreading. All you need is one, and, mm. and it will spread. Okay. Let me come to Dr. Newman. Are you there? Can you hear me? Okay, okay. I can. All right. So, <laughs> so in this case where I'm asking doctor about the diminishing of numbers, just so that we don't you know, extend the fear to the public and all of that. What do you think could do to people just in case we actually realize that the numbers we're recording are actually even more than what is being reported? How is this going to psychologically affect people? Would it be better to let them know that we have more cases or not? Uh, I, I think that uh, generally uh, any negative news is going to cause a certain kind of fear. Any negative news around this time 
it's going to uh, come with some fear. But how the news is broken and how we go about it would either make the fear worse or not. And so I think that it is more about the delivery of the information than the actual information. Because, for example, if someone uh, has lost a relative and you go, the way you go around disclosing that to the person would make uh, the situation worse or not. So I think at this stage, it would be very unwise to cover up. It would be very unwise not to say the truth. But how the truth is delivered is, is, is what is important. Okay. Because we, we, are, we all know what is happening and we are fighting. And yeah. we need to uh, tell the truth. But how we communicate that information is what is going to make it worse or not. Because unpleasant news can be broken in such a way that the impact on the receiver won't be that great. True. Okay, Doc. So for the people who were also in mandatory quarantine, about 1,030 of them, I remember when the first test was conducted, we got, um, what, about 76, was that? Thereabouts. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, the first case. So we had about 76. And then later, 26 people tested positive after the second test. Now, we say we're doing enhanced tracing, contact tracing, where we've tested people and we've put out the numbers of people who have tested positive. Do we need to do a second test of these same samples that have come out already uh, for people who tested negative just to ascertain whether they really are negative or not? Or is one test enough? Um, I think one test is enough, but we should focus on other areas because we have a country with a population of about 30 million and we actually want to get as many people as possible. And um, every, like I said, every single case matters. And so I think we should redirect our focus to other areas like Cape Coast, for example, where we found one person. We quickly have to find out where he's been, who he's contacted mm. and, and things like that so yes. that we... Yeah. Yesterday, the president extended the lockdown by just one week. Uh, I know you said you were not able to catch his address, but I'm sure you've updated yourself already. One right. week. Good enough or not? Um, I think we'll ultimately have to extend it. See, it's not so much what one country or what one president wants. Like um, infectious disease doctors keep telling everybody, no human being dictates the course of the virus. I mean, the virus tells you what you need to do to it. Mm. You know, it's a beast that has arrived. You don't dictate that today I'm going to close the door. If, if, if in a week you realize you have 20 hotspots around the country, nobody would tell um, leadership that, you know what, we, we can't even stop at this point. This is what we have to do. So yeah. it's a matter of closely looking at science, your data, and then following the trajectory of who is getting ill and the trajectory of the illness. Dr. Newman, if one more week has been added, and if you monitor the comments under the president's presentation yesterday, you'd notice that there was a trend. A lot of people, or a greater number of them, kept saying that at least give us a day so we can come out, you know, stretch our muscles, and just interact with people a bit before, you know, you extend the lockdown. So clearly, this is having an impact psychologically on people, is it not? Yeah, it is. You know, there are three things that will be clear at this time. Uh, anxiety, depression, and stress. You know, all the things happening will create some anxiety. Some people who are not able to cope with that this situation may go into depression. And all the things that people have to do in terms of prevention, going about their normal duties at home, trying to find this and that, arrange this and that to be comfortable at home, would cause uh, some, some level of stress. Then, obviously, uh, some anxiety relating to uh, the impact of the disease itself, whether they will catch it or they won't catch it, or when is it going to end and all that. Even some businesses now would have to rearrange all their, their staff in order to be able to... But yesterday, I had a, a, a bad news. One of my friends called me that uh, uh, she's been laid off from, from work. You know, she was just called and said, we can't pay you this man. Stay home. Don't come to work. Uh, you're fired. You know, yeah. and, and so this kind of news and this kind of situation is making a lot of people uncomfortable. Stress is really high. One of the things that we've also noticed around this season is increase in domestic violence, mm -hmm. you know, abuse, you know, has gone, it's gone up all over the world because some people use work and social activities to, to cope with abuse, mm -hmm. abusive and escape from abusive relationships. Right. And this time you are with the abuser in the house 24 seven, you know, so abuse 
has gone up <laughs> and people have no escape. And if, if, for example, if a child is being abused by anybody in the house, it's going to go up. Mm -hmm. So these are actual real psychological situations uh, in, 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 the, in the house, which we have to, we have to th also think about and deal with. I know the government is trying to engage you know, the services of psychologists. They've yeah. got, in, got in touch and engaged Ghana Psychological Association and Ghana Psychological Council. I think these two bodies are really doing well around this time. You know, and so we need to know that beyond COVID-19, you know, all the fiscal things we're talking about, there are major psychosocial implications such that we should be able to even decide that these are the psychologists or these are the people uh, uh, involved now. Mm. These are some contacts. Anybody who has any psychological problem at home, they should go to this place or they should call this number or get to. Yeah. I know now it's possible psycholog Ghana Psychological Association is putting together some numbers to make it public and stuff like that. Okay. Because abuse has also gone up. Definitely. And yeah. I, I hope that they put those numbers out. It's very important. Dr. Bertha, back to you. So there's been yes. a development, and I noticed it yesterday while I was watching the news, where they said that for people who recover from the virus, two things may happen. It's either you build antibodies that fight the virus and so it cannot affect you again. And so such people are donating their plasma uh, for other patients to be treated. Now, the other side is that you could come out with some dire consequences. So either you're suffering from amnesia, um, you know, the very bad extent of it, or you also may suffer from some lung complications as well. Let's talk about the lung complications and the amnesia first, and then we'll end with the good part. Is that really true? Um, yes, it is very, very true. In fact, I've had several of my own patients, which I made a personal observation before I started doing some research. And typically, you would have an elderly couple who live together, and the man will, will present with just a fall. They'll say he fell. And initially, they'll just take the fall as is, but then he would develop a fever. Mm. We would do the test, and the COVID-19 test would be positive. So I started associating falls and confusion in particular with COVID-19. And then sooner than later, they'll bring his wife. Because as I was telling you yesterday, we're realizing that it's a household illness. When a spouse gets it, the other spouse gets it, the children get it, or maybe even the children were the ones who brought it into the, the house. Um, so we're finding these falls and confusion. But then further research has been quite revealing. I actually have a patient right now that we're waiting for tests on. Mm. She presented with meningitis and severe headaches. So we're waiting to see if her COVID-19 test would be positive. But mm. after you, you know, you and I communicated and I started looking into it, apparently the, the virus doesn't just sit, up, sit in the lungs. Mm -hmm. It's been found in brain tissue, kidney, liver, and several other organs, quite revealing. In fact, in 2003, you know, you know this, this COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Um, there is SARS-CoV-1, which caused the SARS outbreak in 2003. There's a doctor who developed the infection, who was mostly in the lungs, and then a week or so later, he started developing these weird neurological symptoms, mm. seizures, etc. He was in Guan, China. And he died. And they did a study of his body and found that he had the virus in his brain tissue. Wow. And so then, scientists have done a lot of um, research on the polymerase, um, little bits of the virus after people have died. And they found it in a lot of organs, including the brain, the kidney, hmm. um, the stomach lining. And so, yes, actually, I think this week or so, the CDC was going to add confusion mm -hmm. and to the thing. So we always said fever, cough, you know, all the nice little things we've said. Yeah. But I think this week they're going to update the guidelines and most hospitals will to include neurological symptoms, mostly confusion, falls, and just not remembering where you are and stuff like that. And but this yes. is going to be what, chronic? Well, I don't think so. Well, this doctor died, the one that they reported on. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I have to do a little... Uh, tomorrow, you know, Monday, I'll give you an update. Whether okay. Some of these people recover, but a lot, a few of the people who came in with the fall, they've recovered from the SARS-CoV. But like you say, like I was saying, this is purely clinical. We don't know whether the the fact that the virus is in brain tissue would translate into some long-term um, neurological deficits later on. But 
-hmm. It is of interest to know that in multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. there are many diseases that we don't know why they occur. Multiple sclerosis is one of them. ALS is one of them. It's called Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. People just develop these unusual neurological symptoms. We still don't have a reason. Apparently, in 2004, there was a study in multiple sclerosis patients, mm -hmm. and they found coronavirus-like viruses in wow. their central nervous system. So, actually, COVID-19 research <laughs> might give us a lot of breakthrough information. Is ALS due to um, a virus? Is multiple sclerosis due to a virus? And we didn't know. So, I'll try and see if I can give you a feedback okay. on Monday. All right. So, All right. The other question you had was about building lung. antibodies against the virus and donating your plasma for treatment. Is that okay. true and how does it work? Okay, so that is very true. As a matter of fact, on March 31st, the American Association of Blood Banks, they came up with a set of guidelines and the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. has issued emergency use authorization to allow hospitals to use plasma from convalescent patients. Yeah. Convalescent means somebody who has had the infection and recovered mm. to be given to patients who are acutely ill, just specifically for COVID-19. It's not like they can use it for something else. Okay. Now, the history goes back to 1918. Um, there was the swine flu um, pandemic, which killed 50 million people. Mm -hmm. And plasma was used extensively. Um, it's also been used in measles outbreaks in the 1930s. And even during SARS in 2003, um, 2009, there was H1N1 outbreak. And even during Ebola, just as recently as four or five years ago, um, plasma was used. The only thing is that it's anecdotal reports of actually helping. We don't know, but we're trying it, you know, okay. because if you have an illness where there is no treatment, it behoves on you to try everything. But then you want to do it based on science. You want to study it. You want to look at patients who did not receive the plasma and those who received it. And you want to check if those who received it would either recover quicker, have less complications, and you use statistical analysis to yeah. come to the conclusion. So at this time, as we speak, several American hospitals are developing the protocols based on the guidelines issued by the American Association of Blood Banks mm. to... Um, collect plasma and donate. So there's a big blood bank drive okay. going on for patients who have recovered. I see. Dr. Newman, I'll come to you shortly, but let's go to Anita. She has a few messages um, on standby, so she'll, she'll give us that, and then we go back to the conversation. Okay, this one says, good morning, with Dr. Bertha speaking. She spoke so well, well, as always. The disease cannot be hidden or manipulated. You even hide in it. You can't be infected. It's better to let it out and let people know how we can manage the spread. Let's all stay safe. Together we unite. And uh, this is for Dr. Newman, and it says, please, I want to suggest that communication of the news thus bring fear in any way if that's the case then the whole issue shouldn't be on the media we need to know and help solve it by supporting the institutions and this one says hello good morning please can you please explain to us the exact districts because fear is killing us all thank you so much please ask dr ai if one can be completely cured from the virus that is if it's undetectable strains will remain after treatment mm. good morning bella i want to know is suspected COVID-19 patients have the right to refuse quarantine because they feel they have the right to. <laughs> Interesting. Hi, good morning. I live at Mamobi Konka with my family and we have a serious, well, okay, this one has to do with water, so definitely we'll come back to that. Okay, same message as well. Okay, this uh, has to do with other... Okay, this has to do with the uh, calculations, calculations we did. Yeah. We'll come back to that one as well. <laughs> a lot of people have a lot of comments as, as well. Okay, so, okay, I think uh, Dr. Ayi and then Dr. Newman can tackle that for us. Okay, Dr. Newman, you heard that comment about the news and the fact that if, you know, you are saying that if we're not putting out the right numbers, then it will not let people understand the real situation. And still, people are scared. So maybe they should not tell us what's happening in the first place. What do you say? I think, I think we should communicate. Uh, then we should do it in a way where uh, it, won't, it won't create a lot of fear. And I think there should be provision for some psychological services. Uh, probably after every communication, maybe a psychologist may come up uh, with something else and, and support whatever they're doing. I think it will help. Okay. But we need to communicate at this time. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Doc, um, so yes. now they're saying, uh, yesterday we, I watched an interview with a mortician and the people who work in the morgue, and they're saying that, you know, ideally they know if someone dies from COVID-19, they are supposed to be buried within 24 hours. Okay. But then in Ghana, we're still keeping the dead bodies. They have not been buried yet. And they're worried because if we're, if we're speculating that a dead person can still transmit the virus, then why are we still keeping these dead bodies in the morgue? Because then they could pass on the infection to the workers there. Is it really true that when you die, you still are likely to pass on the virus? And what should be the time uh, by which we bury these people? Um, so, so with this disease, everything is evolving. And um, leadership have to keep their eyes and ears on the ground and quickly be developing protocols. Like at this time, I know people are studying chloroquine in other places. We should quickly be developing, okay, what can we do? Should we do a study on protocol? How is the FDA going to approve this? And similarly, for people who are dying, we I know it's something we haven't thought about, but the disease is here. So mm -hmm. I think quickly, um, the person in charge of COVID-19 management has to quickly come up with a protocol for what to do with dead bodies, just like it happened in Ebola, where we realized that the dead body was highly, highly infectious. Mm -hmm. And so there was even a limit on the fact that no funerals, like in Italy, you yeah. don't get to see your dead body. Like the COVID-19 dead bodies get put in a particular place, and mm -hmm. it's not even going to be up to the mortician who is going to decide, oh, maybe the government should change the time. No, the bodies go straight to a place and they, they're buried. You're not seeing your, your dead person, period. Yeah. So those are all guidelines that we're going to have to quickly develop over time okay. uh, to manage this. And, and just based on knowing what the virus is, I would estimate that, you know, the fact that the human being is dead does not mean the virus is dead. The virus got into the body to obtain nutrition, nourishment, and to multiply. And that virus can stay alive for 14 days, even at um, 72 degrees temperature. And mm. especially if you freeze the dead body, the virus is able to stay at minus 20 degrees Celsius for two years. Mm. So if, you, if it's in a dead body and you keep it, it's going to stay alive and well in that body for two years plus. Wow. Unbelievable. Yes. Anyway, uh, my last question to Dr. Newman before we wrap up. Now, we're talking about how people are not allowed to see their dead family members before they get buried. I want closure. And so if I lose a family member, especially in such a situation as this, I would want to at least say my final goodbyes. And this is a culture that mm. we have in Ghana where everybody comes to celebrate the person and all of that. How do I deal with the emotional trauma of first of all, not being allowed close to that family member whilst the person was sick. Now the person is dead and I'm being told you cannot see the person and I'm supposed to move on with life like nothing happened. How do I deal with it? Uh, uh, well, uh, it's going to be difficult. Anybody who say it, is, it will be easy, it will be a lie, it will be very, very difficult. But uh, people's mindset about this current situation and the way forward should be one that is positive and one that is community driven, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of mindset helps people make certain sacrifices, are able to deal with their emotions better. A certain mindset that when challenging times, these are difficult, a lot of things will come up that will be uncomfortable, but it is necessary to save everybody and that I need to be a part of this system to make sure that things progress and progress well. A certain kind of mindset helps people uh, have a certain positive emotional responses because how people think influences how they feel and influences mm. how they behave. These three things, how they think influences how they feel and how they feel influences how they behave. Okay. So that should be a certain mindset around this time. But also to help, I think that there should be some communication and some uh, support from those who are in charge of all these barriers. Uh, 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 burying of the dead and all that. There should be some kind of communication between them and the family members. I think there should be some sitting down with them, encouraging them and all that. Then they can also appoint a psychologist to the family to help them deal with the specific issues relating to uh, their emotional you know, uh, responses and all that. So anybody who has a family member in quarantine should have a psychologist attending to them. Mm. Anybody whose family member has to be buried needs a certain psychologist to attend to them because every family is different and depending on the person 
the emotional responses may be different. Mm -hmm. If it is someone the family doesn't like, oh, they really won't care. <laughs> They'll even be happy that you've taken over their barrier for them. You know, if it is a precious person, yeah. <laughs> if it's a precious person, right? If you look at, you know, obituaries, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at even the writings on obituary, some it is what a shock. Others gone too soon. <laughs> others, you know, and others to at long last, you know, the other will be doing Oh, right there's actually at long last. last. I haven't <laughs> seen that before. <laughs> If, if, if we're a bad person, they will write at long last. <laughs> so, so depending, you know, depending on the person, you know, the impact will be will be different. Okay. So that is why for any person whose relative is under quarantine or is dead or something, you need to be able to assign a psychologist. <laughs> Okay. It's good to laugh in this season, right? <laughs> I know, it is. And, and I'm grateful that you're making Dr. Betha laugh this much. Oh I haven't seen her laugh this much ever since we started the show. But thank you both so much for your time. We're very grateful that every morning you dedicate part of your time to educating the public. And so God bless you so much. And please stay you're safe. Welcome. But right. I, I want to say, finally, I want to say that people should relax. This season shall pass. This Amen. season yes. shall pass. Yes. Hallelujah, Pastor Newman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist and Dr. Betha Sewa Ai is an infectious disease specialist. You're